The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Everybody, welcome to Ayan Oshkosh. Cheryl Hentz, along with Dan Rylance, and uh, on this edition of Ayan Oshkosh, we're very pleased to welcome back to the show the interim superintendent for the Oshkosh Area School District, Betty Lang. Uh, Betty is going to be spending the next half hour with us talking about the upcoming school referendum, um, which is one of many things that uh, voters in the area will be voting on on Tuesday, April 7th. And we'll be with Betty for the next half hour. Then, in the second half of the show, we'll be joined by Tony Palmieri. Tony is currently uh, one of six people seeking a seat on the Oshkosh Common Council. He's actually looking to be reelected, as is Jess King. And then there are some other candidates who are seeking to uh, take over the seat being vacated by Brian Bain. So we'll be joined by Tony a little bit later. So Betty, welcome. This is your second time with us. Thank you so much for having me back. It's sure. Wonderful. And uh, we should say Phil Marshall was going to be here tonight, and he's apparently under the weather. Under and the weather. So, yes. And um, is very sorry and sends his regrets. And I hope well, maybe he's tuned in at home. Well, hopefully <laughs> so. So we hope you get feeling better soon, Phil. So maybe by the, by the time, time this airs, yeah, 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 hopefully, yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or he's got real serious <laughs> illnesses. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, we want to just cover the referendum tonight. And, um, you know, there are three questions. And I know you guys have been very busy putting on a couple of uh, community forums, if you will. Yes. You're also holding um, an open house, if you will, mm -hmm. call it that, mm -hmm. at, uh, at Oaklawn, so people can see the condition of that. I did get that information. I put it on the website. But just so viewers have the date, uh, what is that? It's actually Monday night, two dates, the 23rd, right? mm -hmm. and Thursday night, the 26th. And from 5.30 to 7.30, uh, open house, come whenever you can and walk through the building. We'll have people there to point out different areas, but if you'd like to just walk through on your own, you're very welcome to come and do that as well. Okay, all right, very good. Um, well, let's just jump right into this, uh, since we only have, you know, now probably about 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the first question is, of course, permission to issue $15 million in general obligation bonds to construct and equip a replacement Northside Elementary School. And, of course, the location for this is probably one of the more controversial <laughs> things about this referendum, um, in this question in particular, and that's the Riff Road site. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell us why the Riff Road site makes the most sense. Well, I think that people come at it from two different angles. They come at it from the, couldn't we just build on the present Oak Lawn site? And that actually was looked at by the committee. And there were actually three, uh, six committees who studied the facilities for three years and came up with a 10-year plan. And there was a consideration for the present site, but it's small and the uh, school that's there right now is two sections, two first grades, two second grades. The interest was to build a larger school, four section school, to be able to close some of the other schools in the district. So with that in mind, to put a four-section school on that Oak Lawn site and provide parking and provide playground seemed an impossibility, along with the fact that the board and as a community would like to have geothermal heating and cooling and that takes some space. So that present spot was then discarded I guess discarded in that thought. The board then went on field trips up and down uh, Jackson Street and looking in because the area we're talking about, the former Sunset area and the Oak Lawn area is the whole northern part of our school district basically. So there's a lot of space to look at but it also is space that's highly commercial or a park Mm -hmm. or uh, used by other institutions. And after looking up and down Jackson Street or Highway 45, finding that there were some lots, they were a little more expensive because they're commercial. I mean, they're obviously designed for commercial real estate. They And the board owned Riff Road. So after touring those sites and touring Riff Road, the decision was made to put the the school on Riff Road, which is in in an area that could develop as residential. Mm -hmm. It presently is across the street from a residential 
area, a subdivision, and also a church. So, okay. as I often have people say to me, well, where exactly is that? It's actually the cornfield that's across the street <laughs> from the church and that developed subdivision on Riff Road. And if someone doesn't know, Betty, where Riff Road, where this location is mm -hmm. on Riff Road, mm -hmm. can you give them some, um, you know, cross intersections so that they have some sense, or what is it near? It's near, well, Schnell, Snell Road, Snell Road, Snell Road mm -hmm. goes out in that direction, and I think that's been helpful to some people. And if you actually, the way I found it is, I took Highway 40, 21, Highway 21, and there's a big green oh. sign that says Riff Road mm -hmm. to the right. That's how I found it. Okay, and so you go out 21, there. and then, and you then make you a right on to the Riff right. Road. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as you go, then as you drive along, you're going to see the church, and you'll see the subdivision, okay. and then look on your right hand side, and you'll actually see the the uh, school. It's, site again i wish you know there's nothing there to market and that probably would well, be something yeah. in I other we've got a kind general, of you have a general idea it's actually 38.8 acres okay. and okay. the developed school site is a, a little under 15. Okay. so it's it does leave quite a large spot yet yeah, uh, quite a large and this is something acreage. the school district bought quite a few years 1997. ago 1997 oh, yes okay. they bought it in 1997 so and they place. bought it back then um why? Because they anticipated needing to do something like this at some point in the future? That's exactly it. And that's typically why school districts will do that. They'll look at the area, they'll talk to the city, talk to the county and say, where is development happening? And if there's an opportunity, sometimes people come to a district and say, I'm looking at getting out of farming. Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to sell my land. Sometimes you get grant or donations mm -hmm. of land. And in this case, I believe they, they bought the land in that area. Okay. Any idea what they paid for? Uh, I think 397000 I believe, for okay. that land, for 38.887 acres. And in comparison there, looking, they looked at 10-acre uh, site, about almost a 10-acre site on Highway 45 for 600000 mm. So it was a, I mean, I think they did a very good job of purchasing the land at a good mm -hmm. price. And, and you said they bought it in what year? 1997. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, let's talk about why a new school is necessary. I know you brought some pictures of mm -hmm. uh, conditions of, uh, you know, um, Oaklawn, and of course this would be a replacement school for Oaklawn. Um, so why don't we, um, we've got one picture right now that we can uh, take a look at. Now, what is this that we're seeing here, Betty? You're actually looking at the music room. The uh, music room. <laughs> a shopping cart. Yes, a shopping cart. And it actually serves well uh, for ha someone who has to travel from uh, room to room. But one of the concerns about Oaklawn is the, the that is it equitable? Do all students have the same access to, to the different kinds of uh, curriculum that we offer? And obviously there are no keyboards or the kind of things other schools have. And that the teacher does go from room to room and ca carries her equipment that way. And, and most other schools have either a music room that maybe is shared with an art room, but this is this is what we have at Oak Lawn. Can and I interrupt just for yes. a second? Yes. I don't know whether the lady is still the same, but Mrs. Decker, when I was at Webster Stanley, had a music room at Webster Stanley Elementary School certain days of the week, and then she went over to the cart over at Oak Lawn for the other couple days. And yeah. she's, I, I yeah, believe I it, maybe, yes. Wonderful mm -hmm. lady. Yes. The, you know, the mm -hmm. contrast between a room at Webster Stanley and the cart. <laughs> Yeah. It makes it. It is, and yeah. it's hard to deliver the curriculum. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole. I think the whole point of the referendum, Cheryl, as you asked, is can we deliver? It can do students have equal access, and can we deliver the curriculum as well, mm -hmm. no matter what school you go to in the district? And obviously, you can't in that mm -hmm. case. And the other uh, area of interest or concern in the building is the art room, and okay. the art room is actually part of the gymnasium. It's a corner of the gymnasium. Okay, uh, we'll we'll zoom in here okay. shortly. Okay. It's a, just a corner of the gymnasium. I don't know if, if our, the, your viewers can see that, but it's not a, uh, so when gym is going on, we don't have art. That's a question I get. Uh -huh. We try not to have, uh, we have one class at a time. It's either ca the cafeteria for lunch, it's either the gym or the art room. And having these you know, tall cabinets and things in a room where you're running and throwing balls is not a good idea either. So that's, that's the concern. But we do have many schools who do have their lunch in the gym. So oh, that is right. not an unusual thing. It's just having art in the gym as well that, okay. that seems to complicate things. What's that next one that you have This there, is Betty? also art. 
in the gym. This is the other, there are several cabinets and I think that's probably, it creates that, that issue of all the cabinetry and tables and things that are, that are in the gym and mm -hmm. storage and I mean it just, it's not, it's not an easy place for people to work but it is a room for art, you know, in that gymnasium. Okay. The other kinds of things that people are concerned about, are our library there is a very small room, there's no computer lab, uh, there is a computer uh, laptops in a cart and the, the laptops lose their charge around noon and they take a long time to charge up mm -hmm. and the thought was well can we just buy more laptops but then the electricity becomes an issue of where they where we can charge them up right now they sit in the hallway to be charged because that happens to be where the outlet is rooms are small 760 square feet compared to 960 which is the typical size which also means and that's the other reason our, our music teacher is on that small of a cart once she gets in those smaller rooms she can't really maneuver with a large cart yep. and a <laughs> lot of things so they're just it, the when the community group there were 500 people who were part of focus groups in the community mm -hmm. over the past three years and they came up with the equity excellence and efficiency and the equity was a major issue and of course efficiency in the sense of let's do a green and sustainable building and then always keep the cost down and that's I, I believe that's what this referendum does you know if the referendum fails Betty you can you can buy a, a, a round uh, what, are, what are those songs called a, a roundabout or a, not a roundabout I'm thinking <laughs> of roadways now uh, hover round hover round Get a yes. road with a basket on the front end, and then she can maneuver easily yeah, in those small it, it, rooms. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think she gets quite good at that. You know, <laughs> moving things around. Okay. So, what other things do voters need to know about why you guys in the school district feel that question number one should be voted yes on? Well, one of the other interests that, and Cheryl, I can only give information. Obviously, I'm not. An, I can't advocate for one way or the other for the referendum. But one of the things that often comes up as I speak with people is the number of elementary schools that the district has mm -hmm. because of cost, the number of roofs, the number of boilers, you know, all the, the number of staff, you know, administrators and secretaries and everyone. So we, we've talked about that and this school would actually have Lincoln School could close because okay. the former Sunset students right now are at Reed. Those students would go out to Riff Road along with the Oak Lawn students, along with the 90 students who basically belong in Oak Lawn but are in other schools because there aren't any special programs. So then the Lincoln students would move to Reed and Lincoln School could be sold. Okay. And that I think is a part of the long range plan that this district would like to see to become, because one of the things the community said is don't waste money. Well, when you keep many small schools open, I don't know if it's a waste of money, but one section schools are very inefficient. Mm -hmm. And they, so that as taxpayers, I think people would like to see two sections or more. Riff Road will be four sections. The other thing that Riff Road will do is there are, when you have art, music and physical education specialists, if you have a four-section school, all of, they can stay in that building for the day. They're not traveling across town. And of course, right now, we have people who are in two or three schools where they go across town, we pay for travel. So there are a lot of interests there to kind of cut down on that because part of being sustainable and green is to try to keep your people off of the road if you sure, can. Sure. And that brings me to busing. We have 24 buses that go to Oaklawn. Part of the reason is that they're uh, special needs children and English as second language children and people that are, there's no room need to be bused someplace else, so they're small buses. But there are actually eight large buses that go between Oaklawn, Lincoln, Reed in that area. There would be eight buses that would be going to the Riff Road site. And the projection is we would cut down on many, many, many of those shuttles. So we actually would be doing a better job. And, uh, the uh, we do get citizens who say but parents will be driving their cars out there you know it's mm -hmm. and that may happen but mm -hmm. also parents may decide to put children on buses too you know I mean there's that choice of that they don't have to drive their children well, out there. Well but you probably have parents who are driving their kids to the we school do. right now we do. so yeah. um, so basically you'd have eight buses as opposed to as opposed to 24. Well and with the yes the whole combination of buses so we're hoping that would scale down but the eight large buses that run now would still be running so that would be happening. Now, if Lincoln were to be sold, mm -hmm. this all goes through according to the way the district is proposing it, and Lincoln gets sold, what happens to the proceeds from that sale? Does that get applied to the debt service against the referendum, or where would that money go? The board actually has choices. Okay. Some of their choices are just that, Cheryl, apply to the debt service. Okay. They can also say, let's put it into deferred maintenance, and let's catch up on mm -hmm. more maintenance. Yes, we're going to catch up on the list here, but that 10-year uh, plan has an $80 million price tag, so there's more work to be done. They can say, let's put it in the fund balance. They can hold it in the fund balance and then apply it to something later on. So they do have some choices. Uh, 
what I hear from the community, and if the board would ask me, what I most often hear is let's use it to pay down the debt. That's one thing in this community. The debt in the, has been managed so well. The uh, mill rate right now on a $100,000 house is $739 of school tax on a $100,000 house. Because the debt has been managed so well, in 2011, the Traeger referendums paid off. So that's 52 cents goes off of that $7.39. In 2014, the Jefferson referendum, and I'm calling them that because those were the major, there were other right. things done, but those right. are the major things done. That will be paid off and the, the uh, um, debt service goes down 32 more cents. So the way the district has managed, and I have a little, I can just kind of show you, and maybe that I hope I'm painting a good enough picture here. The, the debt will actually, it'll spike up in 2010. State aid starts to come in in 2011, and it goes down. In, tw in 11, that's when Traeger's paid off, and the debt goes down further. It goes down for three years, and then in 2014, Jefferson's paid off, and you take this big drop down. The other interesting thing that I, we're doing this time that we haven't done in the past, as I understand, the number one question is bond. It's bonding for school for 20 years. Questions two and three are permission to raise the revenue cap for five years. So in year six, questions two and three go away, and you're back down to just paying for the new school. And on a $100,000 house, the new school is $16 additional tax a year. Okay. So you know, mm -hmm. if all three questions pass for five years, people would pay $52, and then the sixth year, we'd go back to $16 on that $100,000 house. So again, very mm -hmm. good management by the school boards, past school boards, mm -hmm. obviously, and present boards, to manage the debt in the school district. Well, I, I will just say, I'll, I'll put in my plug here here. If this passes, I would really like to see, and, and Lincoln is sold, I would really like to see as a taxpayer that money put toward the debt service. I mean, if the citizens in this community are going to step up to the plate and vote in favor of a new school, then I think it's only right that the district turn around and give the taxpayers something mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a kind of a we hear it all the time in relation to unions, but a quid pro quo, quo yes. kind of thing, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know. If, if referendum you. number mm -hmm. sorry, mm -hmm. if referendum number one passes, when would this school be ready? It, they would break ground in fall of '09, and then okay. it would be ready probably January of 2011. Okay. And then the uh, then the discussion would be: Do we move in January? Or wait you know, until do the fall. we wait till you know the end of the school year and move over the summer, okay. or how would they do that? So, but that's the projection. Okay. It takes about a year and a half to build a new school, and you know, and the, I know that these are not good economic times. I do hear that too as I speak with different right. groups. Mm -hmm. But it also, it's that double-edged sword. It's also time when costs are lower for equipment and materials right. when people are looking for work and it you know so there are it's it's just that double-edged sword okay. of what one other do. question mm -hmm. on number one if it passes we talk a lot about stimulus and spending mm -hmm. what what would the construction of this building do for the economy of Oshkosh in terms of local contractors Empl uh, employees, any any projections on that? Well, the board, as they go out to bid this uh -huh. project, can write into the contract that they want local labor, okay. and, and not that it would be local labor labor that would cost them more, but that they would like the contractor to subcontract with local labor. So that could be put in there. The other part of it is there are jobs of all types. I mean, there are obviously highly skilled jobs when you build a school, right. but there mm -hmm. are labor jobs sure. that are that other, you know, right. people can do who aren't highly trained in a certain area right. or licensed. So that's the that's the hope that there will be, I mean, the board is very committed to making this part of mm -hmm. economic development for the community. And I believe schools are part of the economic sure. development of a community. Okay. All right. Question number two. And by the way, um, for viewers' information, I received uh, something by email today that has a lot of this referendum material on it. It's been posted on the website. It contains a number of links that you can go to that show some of the graphs and, and charts and photos and things that Betty has brought with her this evening. And um, I think there's also a link to the district's website yes. that has a mm -hmm. lot more information mm -hmm. on it as well. Mm -hmm. So um, just go to ionoshkosh.com or ionoshkosh.blogspot.com. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so it's, it's all there. Uh, all right, so question number two then um, is permission to spend $1.3 million in excess of revenue limits mm -hmm. for deferred maintenance projects in each of the next five budget years. So that's a total of uh, $6.5 million mm -hmm. uh, over the course of five years. Mm -hmm. um, and why is this so important? 
Well, there's so it's very difficult under revenue caps. In 1993, Cheryl, revenue caps went into place along with mm -hmm. a QEO, Qualified Economic Offer, and then also a certain amount of state aid. And when revenue caps went into place, they actually took away some of the board's local decision making in setting the mill rate and the tax levy because the cap now says you can spend only to this much, so go ahead and set it, but it only can be this high. Across the state of Wisconsin, boards had to make some difficult decisions and they had to make decisions between do we keep the teacher in the classroom and keep the class size smaller or do we put in the new boiler? I mean, the, a boiler, for example, at a, a elementary school is about $950,000. I mean, they're very expensive. So I believe what the district did is they did maintain things the best that they could, but what our the public management partners and Brain Associates and Sodexo said, three independent companies said, some of your the Boilers, some of your buildings, Oaklawn in particular, have aged beyond their life. You are putting good money after bad. You need to stop doing that and make some other decision. So with that in mind, the 10-year uh, plan pulls out the maintenance, the high cost items like changing out windows, putting in a new boiler. Things We have 1953 boilers, you know, we have windows that are, are single pane and, and as I t I sw I've had the great opportunity to go to every school or almost every school to speak about the, the referendum and they tell me the things in the schools that you know like the windows that need replacement and the elevator shaft that needs to be fixed and those kinds of things some are safety issues some are actually safety issues and some are, are upgrades for efficiency so that we can get a payback and I have to say our public service works very well with us to get payback on changing out a light fixtures and those kinds of things okay. so this is really catching up on Deferred maintenance. Yes, piece. it is. On the high ticket, mainly because yeah. the small ticket items we're always able to handle. Right. The other thing I think the board is, I'm very happy to do and proud to do, is make a commitment to try to get more money in the yearly maintenance budget. Right. So to, to try to chip away at this from, you know, yearly as well as taking on the large projects that are, that are in the referendum. Okay. Yeah. A lot on roofs, a lot on roofs. Yeah. Um, boilers, windows, like you said. It's the big, big it's ticket, big, yeah. yes. And we do maintain roofs, but again, you reach a point where a roof ages out and you've got to replace that section or you've got, you know, you've got to do something more, something yeah. bigger. All right. All right. Okay, and then uh, question number three um, is seeking permission to spend a half million dollars in excess of revenue limits again for small additions and renovations to existing schools and equipment acquisitions in each of the next, again, five budget years. Mm -hmm. So that's a total of 2.5 million. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about that one. There were six teams who did all the work and at team number six is the one that culminated. It brought all the work over that three years together and, and actually constructed the plan. And in that plan, when it came time to go to referendum, the board said, what are the highest needs? What are the things that we absolutely need to get done? And as the team discussed it, they said safety and security is something we need to do. And there are two ways that they're doing it. They actually are looking at moving some physical walls to put the entrances near a door. Well, for example, West High School, if you've ever been in there, the mm -hmm. offices are in the middle of the building yep. and you walk through the whole building to get there. And so the office would be moved close to a street where you'd walk into a foyer, you have to go into the school office before you can get to the rest of the school. So that's the monitoring of foot traffic. Jefferson Elementary actually has an entrance like that if you've ever been there. The new school will have that type of entrance. The other is surveillance cameras, signage, door locks, you know, the kind of things that seem pretty common sense but need to really be checked in order to be safe. When we were doing the conceptual design, one of the things I heard over and over was, you know, there are schools that you can't find the front door, and I can attest to that because sometimes the schools are built and then the, you know, landscaping changes or yeah. whatever around it. If there's not a sign, you can't find the front door. Right. So that's part of security, too. It's sure. like, here's the front door, come in here. So, and then as far as surveillance, not all schools will have changes, West would be one, but surveillance cameras need to actually record. We have monitors that see people coming in, but we actually need to record uh, who's going in and out. And then that would also be an opportunity to look at what we have presently in the district and upgrade the computers or the surveillance equipment that's in the buildings for the other buildings. Okay. Again, Oaklawn and uh, Lincoln would not be two schools that would be having benefiting from these funds. Okay. Yeah. Editorial, just a brief yes. comment. <laughs> You know, security, 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 it's all kind of a post 9-11 thing. When you were here last time, I asked why the seven yeah. schools didn't allow the neighbors to see the children when they voted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm maybe too old, but you know, at, at some point, you're not going to protect 
society forever from every possibility. You're right, Dan. And the only the thing that really makes a difference is relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, when students talk to each other and adults mm -hmm. and students interact, that's what really keeps them safe. But we can make a step forward, I think, by monitoring that foot traffic, knowing who's in and out of our buildings. Yeah. You know, I just that's part of. I think it, nowadays parents live with that constant well, fear do. since 9/11. You know, mm -hmm. you got to be proactive because it yes. just takes one incident. That's and, it. and that's it. Mm -hmm. But, gee, you know, do you want your kids to grow up in, in that environment? Yeah, exactly. Not to talk ever to a stranger? Mm -hmm. Never to see a neighbor come and vote? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'm or see you through the glass. That's, that's all right. they can do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, you know, I, I, it's kind of like a prison of their own. <laughs> yes, sort of. Yeah. I appreciate it, but it, it's, it says something about our age, I think. Yeah. All and right. about our society. It does. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Times have changed, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got about three and a half minutes left, so let's let's hit two things real quickly here. Yes. Number one, uh, if question number one fails, which is the biggie for the new mm -hmm. school, um, you know the information here says that there are no provisions being made um, for Oaklawn or Lincoln. So, um, what will happen there if? You know, and I let me rephrase that. Mm -hmm. No provisions from two and three. If exactly. those were to pass right. and mm -hmm. one were to fail, mm -hmm. nothing from two or three will be used for uh, those two schools. So what happens? If we would have something like a roof fall in or some safety concern at either of those two schools, it would be paid for out of the general budget, that the yearly mm -hmm. budget, because mm -hmm. we have to keep the building safe. The message here is that there won't be great upgrades. You know, there won't be, we won't do electrical fixtures. We aren't going to do those kinds of things and upgrade those buildings. That the board is committed to doing something to improve that at the Oak Lawn situation. And I think on April 8th, there's a board meeting on April 8th, and I know uh, depending <laughs> on what happens on April wow. 7th, right. the board may want to wait. And I'm going to ask to have a workshop or maybe a retreat right. to revisit that 10 year plan because no matter what happens on April 7th, there's still more work sure. to be done. Yep. And I think uh, the board needs to look and say, okay, how do we regroup or what are we going to do now? One of the things we can't do is stop moving forward. I mm -hmm. mean, we have children, new children coming every yeah. year, you mm -hmm. know, and they deserve a good place to be in school. And so I think that's part of the uh, Board of Education's mission is to make sure that they're always on top of those facilities and, and moving us forward with you know, positive momentum. Okay. And if all three fail, then what? I would be right back there, Cheryl, with the board saying, okay, here we are. I One of the things that, that I've done in the past that's worked kind of well is to invite people in who had problems with the questions, you know, mm -hmm. with, and to try to glean from them. So what would have helped you? What, did you not get enough information? Did you just plain disagree mm -hmm. with, a, a, you know, a part mm -hmm. of the question or the site? Uh, what feedback can you give us? Because I don't think a board should ever go out with the exact same referendum. Mm -hmm. I think you should talk with people, find out where maybe the glitches were or what people really objected to, uh, and then, then reframe your referendum and go back. And I have heard from some people the timing of it, I mean, they when they look at this chart with mm -hmm. the mill rate, they say, yeah. you know, maybe Maybe two years would have been better. And all I, I can only answer is I think the board was ready now. I think the teams all did their homework. I think the district sure. was ready. And I think we need to go out and, and ask. And again, it, the bottom line is the way the funding formula is structured, the community has got to decide the quality of the schools. The Board of Education is limited mm -hmm. in what it can do. Yeah. Very quickly, um, I, I noticed in today's paper uh, the district is, is looking at getting some uh, enrollment numbers together. Mm -hmm. And, and enrollment has been declining. Um, you know, that obviously begs the question, why did you not do that before coming forward with a referendum? Thank you for asking me that, Cheryl. Uh, in general, if, if we look at a K-12 Oshkosh district, it is declining. The elementary is not declining. The elementary is actually growing a little bit. What's happened is over the last five, and s five or six years, instead of having 900 kindergartners come in every year, we've had 700. And we've had consistently 700 come in for the last five or six years, so we have 700 per grade level. Seventh grade through 12, we still have 850 and 900 per grade mm. level. So we are going to be a declining enrollment district till those large groups move through the district. Okay. This school is not being built on an increase or decrease in population. It's being built on the idea that we need to have not so many rooftops and to pull together you know, students in that home, so, so their neighborhood area, they create a school. We have all of the students who need to go to that school. They are presently living in, in our district right now. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, again, our, our regrets that Phil 
couldn't be here. Yeah. But Thanks but well. we're always happy to see yeah. you. Thank you. So, it's a pleasure. It's thanks a pleasure. so much Thank for, for helping to kind of lay this out for us. And uh, again, you can contact the school district directly with their website. You can get there through our website. A number of ways in which to do it, but there's a lot of information out there. So uh, very good. Thank you so much good luck. again. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. You We're going to take a real quick break. And in just a couple minutes, we'll be joined by Oshkosh Common Councilman Tony Palmieri. We'll be right back. mom and dad. Well, I finally have some time off, so I'm writing to tell you that I'm doing well. We have good days and bad days over here. We try to remember the good ones and get through the bad ones. Mostly we have each other, and that's what keeps us going. And mom, since you asked, if anyone wants to help, just tell them to contact the USO. You can't believe how much they do for us. With love, your son Michael. Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security benefits, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. We were in an emergency situation. We don't have extra. We have a little bit of water and a little bit of food. A meeting no. place, no. No. I don't think we have a first aid kit. We have tuna fish, we have right. beans, we tuna. have um, um, beans. canned tomatoes, true. you know. That's true, but uh, that's really not survival food. Tomato we, paste. Yeah, well, oh. yeah. Right? Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the second half of I and Oshkosh. We're pleased to be joined now by our former co-host and um, Oshkosh Common Councilman, uh, currently seeking re-election, Tony Palmieri. Tony, thanks for being here. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Yep. Thanks for uh, uh, continuing to always be such a, uh, a diligent councilman yes. in, yeah. in uh, the efforts that yeah. you've done. And I would done. like to make a little presentation before we start, if that's okay. Oh, okay. okay. Go right ahead. We, we oh, know, no. and this, the, the, <laughs> We want you to feel at home <laughs> for, this, for this show, okay? Because we know that the deer love you, and, and one of the deer wanted to be here for the show. Boy, if the deer could vote, that would be like another 11 to 40 votes, right? Well, actually, I have another deer. Okay. Uh, so you have two votes. <laughs> and that one's, uh, he's oh, falling man. apart. We were losing one of the, one of the glues came off this one. Oh, but the, it is uh, a the sharpshooters the got, sharp got it in the leg. The sharpshooters got it in the leg. But anyway, we just wanted. I knew you were going to be up to something. I couldn't. You know, we just wanted it. to make you feel at home. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your good humor and response. Sure. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, that being said, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, I do want to thank you for your, um, you know, your diligence in, in the last two years. Because uh, while I haven't always agreed with all your votes, um, you know, or sometimes the manner in which you go about it, you know, I have to give you credit for um, sticking true to your convictions, mm -hmm. no matter what. You know, and, and for continuing to ask questions, um, sometimes people may think it's, it's to the point of ad nauseum, but, you know, <laughs> you want your questions answered. And, you know, when you have questions that you want answers to and you're not getting yeah. them, you sometimes have to try to ask the questions in a different way. Yeah. And I think that's what you try and do. Yep. So Appreciate that. Yep. So anyway, um, the, the current council, of course, is, is sort of, you know, for years it was 6-1 or 5-2, and mm -hmm. now it's kind of 4-3. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of on the same team, if you will, as Paul Esslinger and Dennis McHugh. And, yeah, uh, although, you know, people say that all the time. Well, I'm and talking I, about just in general type right, terms, not I, on every vote. Right, I know. But if I consider myself a genuine independent on that mm -hmm. council, mm -hmm. that while I'm associated frequently with Dennis and Paul, if you look at things like the convention center renovation, I voted for it. Yep. They didn't vote for it. If you look at the TIF district for the Brian Burns development on Main Street, yep. I voted for it. They didn't vote for it. Mm -hmm. 
If you look at the capital improvements budget, I voted for it. They didn't vote for it. If you look at the mayor's climate protection agreement, which I'm very proud of that uh, on our council these last two years, I voted for that. They didn't vote for that. The roundabout, I voted for that. They didn't vote, vote for it. Those are some pretty core mm -hmm. issues. Obviously, the deer. <laughs> I was the only one on the council. That's right. We have the deer here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was the only one out of seven. So, so I think you know. I think every candidate always says that if they get on the council, they're going to be a true independent. Yeah. And I would argue that if you look at my record, I actually have been an independent. If you look at where I've lined up. Well, and that was kind of the point that I was going to because mm -hmm. you know the other candidates they've not served, and so we kind of asked them where, where they, they oh. kind of fall. Okay. Yeah. And of we course, they probably, did, they probably said, oh, I look at every issue independently. Well, yeah, yeah that was pretty much it. <laughs> and, and my point was that, you know, candidates over the years, and you used to be sitting in this chair, yes. you know, they all kind of say the same thing. We're going to ask the tough questions, yeah. you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And I think we all appreciate that as voters. Mm -hmm. But then a transformation seems to happen to them. They get on that council dais and... I don't know. They they seem to kind of fall in in one of these two camps, and but you haven't been. I mean, a lot of the votes you mm -hmm. have sort of been with Esslinger and McHugh, but you are right. There have been a lot where you haven't, and and I think that that's what sort of sets you aside a little bit is that you haven't come mm -hmm. under this metamorphosis, if yeah. you will. So well, I mean, I I think that we're obligated as elected officials to look at the evidence in front of us, judge it as best as we can. Mm -hmm and then speak the truth as we see it, advocate for a position. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll land on one side, sometimes you'll land on, an, mm -hmm. on another side. So I don't know how that transformation happens, but I, yeah, I did make the same observation when I was in yeah. that. that yeah. I, I think because they now are elected is the transformation. Yeah. Things change, don't you yeah. think? Well, but they haven't for Tony so much, and no, I don't, no, and but I don't I, think yeah. that they really should. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it, is, it, is dif it is difficult to sit there, especially when lots of people show up, and it's difficult to go against sure. uh, when people, like for example, on the deer issue, mm -hmm. for one year, all we heard were from people who want to see the culling. And it was difficult to be the only one up there who kept saying, maybe it's time to look for other solutions or whatnot. And you know, numerous other issues are, are like that. Yeah. So, and I, and I think that's something to, to be wary of in candidates. You have to ask yourself, is, is this someone who will easily cave in to pressure or will they stay true to evidence and reasoning and so on. Okay. Well, speaking of the calling, um, yeah. you know, because we're moving into a different season now, mm. the, the calling itself um, has kind of come to, uh, to an end. But I, I think I know what your answer is going to be. But, you know, in, in light of some of the things that have come up, you know, the overfeeding, yeah. which, um, you know, probably resulted or played a role, at least, in the death of, of sure. at least one deer. Um, you know, and, and just some of the other things that, uh, and I think you maybe brought this uh, to, the to the public, or maybe it was Amy Habercorn, where there apparently was a third date set for a calling, um, it, where and people were not notified right, right, of right. it. And do you think that the city has, has mismanaged this in some way? I mean, forget about the position of, either for or against right. the, the calling. Do you think the city's mismanaged it? I think clearly it's been mismanaged. There was a uh, permit issued by the uh, DNR with uh, guidelines for how it should be conducted. It looks pretty clear now that they were not followed, I mean, especially on the, the uh, overfeeding and what have you. Yeah. But you know, at this point on that issue, it really is time to move forward and what I'm going to try, if the voters bring me back, mm -hmm. what I will try to do, hopefully with help of other counselors, is to create a genuine deer management committee that most cities who do culling have. And on that committee, you, put, you appoint people from all sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that way, no one feels like they were not heard. That kind of committee is a space with which all solutions can be looked at in, in depth. The problem we had here was that too many people felt that they were not heard. They felt that all options were not looked at. And so consequently, it seems like every other meeting, this uh, tension is playing out before the council. Yeah. It really should be playing out in a deer management committee. So I think we really do need to create that. Okay. And, and because some things, in your opinion, have been, and, and mine too, have been mismanaged, do you think that that's enough right there to 
cancel the contract, mm -hmm. and if you decide uh, or the council decides to go forward with calling in the future, mm -hmm. uh, a new contract be be let. Yeah, I, you know, as a practical matter, even if the contract is not ca uh, canceled at this point, there will be no more culling in in the spring and summer months. Right. 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 But they could as we move into fall. Yeah. Yeah. They, under yeah, that right. current yeah, they contract. Possibly could. Contract so goes to the end. Your mic yeah. came off again. To the, uh, it goes to the end of, of December, I believe. Uh, I, yeah, I think it would be time to, uh, to cancel it. Um, you know, if you look at the DNR guidelines for when culling should take place, I mean, uh, my position on this has never been based on animal rights. My position has been based on the conditions under which the DNR says you should cull. And those conditions to me were never met. And so, uh, yeah, I'd say cancel the contract and let's try to move forward okay. in a way that, that doesn't end up making more than half of the community very, very upset. Okay. Well, something that made some counselors upset <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was the recent closed session yeah. on, um, you know, the, the evaluation of city manager Mark Roloff. Yeah. And, and I don't... <laughs> See, we got hung up on a word here. We got hung up on goals. Yeah. And I had wished, um, both at the time the meeting was going on and after, that, I mean, this meeting was not attended by you, Dennis McHugh, or Paul Esslinger. Mm -hmm. I had wished that the three of you would have at least gone into the meeting. Right. And, you know, then if it got into a discussion of goal setting, then said, you know what, this right. does not fall under what the law permits for a closed session meeting and I'm out of here, you know, and then you guys could have left. But y you weren't even at the table to do an evaluation yeah. and, and so that was disappointing. Well, I struggled with that and <coughs> what happened is the discussion we were having before the closed session took place made it clear to me, and I say this with all due respect to my colleagues on the council, they had no idea why they were going into a closed session. Some thought it was to discuss process, which the city attorney said to us in open session, you can't go into discuss process. Mm -hmm. Others seemed to think it was to have, a, a, this was I think Frank Tower's position, it was going to be to discuss evaluation and goals. At the meeting at least, he was not backing down from that. I think Burke Tower said that what we were doing was a process similar to the one that we'd done with former city manager Wolank. So we had these different views and I'm sitting up there thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm hung up on the goals, but another part of it is we don't even know why we're going into a closed session. Yeah. So I thought with all that confusion, the right thing to do would have been, you know what, folks, time out, time to start over. And, you know, eventually that's what happened. Mm -hmm. At the last meeting on March 10th, uh, Deputy Mayor Bain, I give a lot of credit for this, he and Assistant City Manager Fitzpatrick came up with a process that while I still don't like it, it's doable. And so I think not going into the meeting was dramatic, right? But I think, I think it drove home the point, and I, I think it helped result mm -hmm. in a more rational process going forward. But I did struggle with it, Cheryl, yeah. and, and I, don't, you know, I didn't like not going in, but yeah. I thought you shouldn't go into a closed meeting when there's that much confusion. And you know, sometimes we go into these closed meetings, and it's hard to go out once yeah. you, once you, like for example, after the March 10th meeting, we had a closed session so that David Patek, Director of Public Works, could tell us that the deal we're making to buy the Kentucky Fried Chicken building is going to be something like $20,000 less now. Oh. And I'm sitting there thinking, why is that private? <laughs> <laughs> the, under, the, under the statute that yeah. talks about competitive bargaining and all that, there's no competition. We, we know that we're buying the Kentucky Fried Chicken building. They know that we're buying it. So in order to hear that, that it, we're getting a little better deal here, that had to be in closed session. Uh, give, give us some sense, Tony, of what, um, I, I'm not asking for specific information about what goes on in these meetings, but by the way, once, once that issue that you are in a closed session for has, has come full circle, um, that information can, and I believe should be released to the public. How, how come we never hear about uh, what has happened in closed sessions? I think that the Oshkosh Common Council and, and city administration historically has followed the narrow letter of the law. What we tend to do is the minimum amount you need to do to pass muster, if you will, with state law. And I think we need to do, uh, we need to do better. We don't take minutes in the meetings. Right. The meetings are not, I mean, if it were completely up to me, I don't have majority support for this on the council. Uh, we would at least audio tape all of those meetings. Mm -hmm. 
if only to protect the city. Do you I mean, take votes in these meetings? There, I, I don't think votes can be taken. Well, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't think we take votes. Okay. No, like not no, yeah. not we. We get consensus <laughs> in meetings. It's, it's kind of like. Is everyone okay with this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. like a straw poll vote. Yeah. yeah they're and like, and yeah. then when you come into open session, yeah. that's when the formal vote yeah. is taken. So and that's it, actually, kind of and that's, well, notes. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. We went to arbitration, right, on the basis of a closed meeting, and not everybody in that meeting wanted to go to arbitration, right? I, for example, thought it was ridiculous to go to arbitration mm -hmm. under the evidence that we looked at. So we never took a formal recorded vote, but there clearly was a vote in that closed meeting. Mm -hmm. Everyone in that room knew who was for going to arbitration sure. and who wasn't. And see, I think, Cheryl, that should be released as a vote. Yeah, well, I, I agree. So, so that was going to be my question before I got off on this other thing. Uh -huh. um, give, a, give us a sense of, you know, who is there besides just the council members? Do you, is the city attorney there to help guide you along? City attorney's there. Okay. The uh, city clerk is there. Even though she's not taking notes. Even, right. Right, she's okay. there to to get the uh, the roll call. Okay. She's there to record when it ends. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's essentially what she does. The city attorney is there, and then whatever staff member Would who's most it. responsible for the issue at hand. So okay. David Patek for the Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, Jackson Kinney is in a lot of closed meetings that mm. deal with Doesn't development. Doesn't surprise me. Right. <laughs> so, uh, assistant city manager Fitzpatrick. You know, depending on what the issue is. Yeah. Okay. Can I get back to just goals for a sec? When Absolutely. you hired the new city manager, did he have goals that you gave him with the We did not give him any formal goals. Now, what I but what I had assumed, yeah. and you should never assume I've learned, <laughs> is that the 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 main goals of any city manager that we would hire right. are in the city ordinances. Right. If you look at our city ordinances, there are I think ten or eleven responsibilities, and I thought if we're going to evaluate the city manager, it's according to how well he's doing doing that. Okay. <laughs> we didn't write any goals when he was hired. You think that was a mistake? Well, I, it's hard for me to answer that because yeah. this whole process to me is so bizarre. But you hire a city manager and you don't yeah. give him goals when you hire him? But are we getting hung up on goals, on the word okay. goals? Okay, he, well. He, was he given, a what kind of a job description yeah, yeah, thank was you. he given? Yeah. Or was I don't he think I don't think his contract, uh, well, we, the job description is what was advertised okay. when he applied. Okay. Remember that lengthy yep. 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 document with tons of things stated? So I guess in a sense those mm -hmm. were the goals. They were not formally adopted by the council except to be in that job hmm. uh, description. But, you know, you're kind of touching on this form of government and whether it works for Oshkosh. <laughs> and, and, I mean, okay. you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not interested in ever changing that form of government on the strength of a vote of seven council members. But as I said at the League of Women Voters Forum, if citizens came forward with a referendum to change it, I would probably uh, mm -hmm. s support it. Because, you know, the academic textbooks will tell you that the manager form of government like we have works best when you have consensus in your city on a variety of issues, and then you simply hire a professional to put that consensus mm -hmm. in place. Right. You try to shield him or her from politics as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Oshkosh clearly does not have consensus on a wide range of issues, and I end up feeling bad for, huh. for the city managers because, because there is so much division in the community, they end up being damned if they do mm -hmm. and damned if they don't. So, you know, our, our city really is cut out for a strong mayor system mm -hmm. where you could have one candidate running on downtown revitalization, the other candidate running on fix the streets. Mm -hmm. One of them's gonna win. And then that person gets to put their vision in place. If they do it well, they might get reelected. If they don't do it well, we'll change course in four years. But you know, maybe this is an academic discussion because the <laughs> it, it looks like we're going to be with this for a while. And I, you know, I'm working as hard as I can within the system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some specifics. Uh, do you favor retention ponds at the West Haven Golf Course? No, but largely because of the way it was handled. Okay. We put ourselves in a position. This happens too often in City Hall. The plan was hatched okay. before the community was brought on board. Okay. Now they went and changed the covenants so that if the city did try and go forward with this, we could be in law uh, lawsuits, multiple lawsuits, okay. that could go on forever. Okay. So I think because of the way this was botched, it's time to look for another location. Okay. That is, that is off, it's off okay. the table at this point. It just can't happen. I want to play with the term neighborhood. 
Mm -hmm. It's one of the three things that, that you said in the Northwestern that you wanted right. neighborhood development. Sure. What is a neighborhood? Wow, what is a neighborhood? I suppose a neighborhood is a collection of citizens, homeowners, renters, okay. that share some common identity. Okay, let's take Parkway. You live on West Parkway, mm -hmm. I live on East Parkway. I don't sense I live in a neighborhood. I sense I live on East Parkway. Mm -hmm. Do you sense living on West Parkway that you live in a neighborhood or are you just on the street? No, I agree with you. I think there's been a breakdown in, in yeah. there's been a breakdown in what you might call neighborliness. Yeah. I mean, I know people on East Parkway, yeah. I know a couple of them in Roll, but if I expanded that to some definition of neighborhood, I don't know anybody yeah. and I have no contact with anybody. Well, we did approve the Neighbor Works organization from right. Green Bay, and one of one of their goals is going to be to revive that spirit okay. of neighborliness. Okay. How you know you're promoting that, and I'm just curious, what how are we going to do that? Other than you said hiring them, but well, what they claim is that they're going to try and um, appoint, and then I guess elect neighborhood associations, okay. uh, people who have the time, the desire to do some work to figure out what the neighborhood's goals okay. are. Okay. Uh, they can, neighbor works can then be a liaison with, okay. with, uh, with City Hall. So, but I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, th I don't think this is unique to Oshkosh. Right. There's been a breakdown right. in what it means to be a neighborhood. Uh, part of it has been, and uh, I think this is what the Near East neighborhood was designed to address, part of it has been when an area gets into such deep disrepair, uh -huh. that breaks down the spirit of neighbor neighborliness. The problem we've had with the Near East Neighborhood Program is that it's been perceived as being conducted in such a heavy-handed way. Right, right. You have to do this. You ha exactly. Yeah. So we need to make that program more people-friendly, and that's the main reason why I voted for Neighbor Works. Yeah. Because I'm hoping that they can make our neighborhood programs more people-friendly. Do neighborhoods have neighborhoods have rights? I think? think so. But you've been one that's not given many neighborhood rights on the Deer issue. You wanted it citywide. These na this neighborhood came with an issue. Uh, oh, I disagree, though. If you look at that neighborhood, yeah. if you look at the totality of the survey taken in the neighborhood affected by deer, the majority of people in that neighborhood did not want culling. They weren't very vociferous no. in, in not wanting culling, though. No, they were not. They were, no, because if you listen to them, they claim, this is what they're telling me, that when the results of that survey came out, they assumed that it would be a case of where majority rules. Okay. That the city council and or administration would look at that survey and say, well, clearly the majority of people don't want to go down the road of sharpshooting. Yeah. So they assumed, I think reasonably, that they did not have to be more active at, uh, at, at that point. Now, the chief responded to that by saying, well, the goal of that survey was not really to find out what the neighborhood wanted. The goal of the survey was to find out how extensive the problem was. Mm -hmm. Well, that's well, then why not send it out to more people? I mean, why send it out to just that? Well, especially then? since we know that there are deer and we're talking about you again, <laughs> especially now that we know there are deer in multiple parts of the city, right? Uh, Evergreen, Riff yeah. Road. So we probably... You've had deer in your area too, yes. where you live. Yeah. I I've yeah. seen them because I and, used to and, live you know, in that again, area. You know, I completely empathize with people who've had damage with this. Okay. But the DNR says you have to look at your biological carrying capacity, which they say you determine by an aerial survey. We did an aerial survey, we find 11 deer. Everyone knows there's more than 11, but the fact is they found 11. Mm -hmm. Then they say there's a social carrying capacity, which means do people want it? Mm -hmm. You determine that by taking a survey of people. We take that survey, the majority of people say, don't sharpshoot. So, so on both criteria the DNR set, biological and social, the evidence we had in front of us <laughs> said, don't call. Okay. But we were told by our chief of police and, and others that even though the evidence claimed that, we should just still go ahead with sharpshooting. So again, it wasn't based on an animal rights perspective. I'm not an animal rights activist. Okay. It was based on the evidence I have in front of me says we should, at the, and this is what I argued, at the very least, let's give it a year to see if the deer feeding ban works mm -hmm. and let's enforce or encourage people to plant in different ways mm -hmm. and what have you. Instead, we went and did the sharpshooting in one year. And I don't know, Cheryl, they went out three times and got six deer and my understanding is, of the six, two of them were adult doe. And from what I hear about culling, what you're trying to kill are the doe, mm -hmm. because they give birth, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think they killed two doe, two bucks, and two fawns, Som something, something of that, like that. Uh, something like that. 
Do you want to, we've only got like four and a half minutes yeah. left. Do you want to real quickly go through some of these other questions? Sure. Um, I'm curious on your last uh, website, you, you, you went through and analyzed all of these yeah. common council minutes. <laughs> you went through 45 <laughs> of them. I got OCD on this one. Why? why why are you spending all the time doing that? Because I hear, <laughs> because I hear, I hear, I hear you. I hear Stu Rickman. I hear others making it sound like this council has been just the, you know, like you know over bloviating that we you know. And, and I looked at the minutes and I thought, yeah, we've had some long meetings. Yeah. But the reality is, seventy-one percent of our meetings have ended before ten o'clock. I didn't realize we had that much power that you even know. spend all that time <laughs> but, analyzing forty-five but, uh, you know, meetings. I, but I'm real. <laughs> This is serious to me because I think the, the, the word that's gotten out about this council is that we, I mean, I'll give you one example. I did even more research on this, right? <laughs> I, I, I mean, got to get into this, all right? On um, December 11, 2007, the, our meeting went until 11.27 p.m., right? Which okay. you think a very long meeting. That night, we had 31 citizens speak, right? Th but by the way, that's 31 only on the cornerstone recovery issue. It's got them quantified right. too. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, seriously, I mean, do we want a city council to do its, the, the common word these days is due diligence. Yeah. But then the moment we do our due diligence, we talk too much. So. I, if I asked you how much percent of time did you spend on those 45 councils? That I haven't looked up yet. <laughs> <laughs> that I haven't looked up yet. Okay. And I will admit that there are, there are times when I probably go on too long. I, I acknowledge that. Okay. But if you look at city councils before this current one, you'll find the majority of meetings and usually between six and eight. Now, if the citizens want to go back to that, that's fine. But it's going to mean you're going to get things like EAA not paying sewage fees that just gets rubber stamped mm -hmm. and passed because people don't want to raise questions. They don't want to waste time. Okay. Well, you know. How about eliminating council member statements? Well, you know, there have been a lot less in this last year. But were you, you're really the haven't. only legislative body I know that has, you know, you get an extra hour at the end of the meetings. <laughs> I don't think anyone has spoken for an hour during council member statements. No, collectively. Okay. Yeah. Why have them? Well, I think sometimes they are needed. I mean, sometimes there are issues that there is not a... Well, I'll tell you this. I would rather have council member statements than the workshops because the workshops are being abused. Okay. What's happening in the workshops is the council is giving direction to city staff to proceed with issues, that's a way to circumvent public participation and a way to circumvent the creation of resolutions and ordinances. At least in council member statements, you are on more solid ground to create a resolution or ordinance, I would argue. But yeah, they shouldn't be abused. I mean, I think they should be used sparingly. Yeah. Um, I haven't added up how many I've had. <laughs> I'm not I asking. Can't, <laughs> I can't do that. Okay, no, no, I understand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, just real quickly, um, because we're almost out of time, but um, you know, if, if you're reelected to a second yes. term, Tony, what would be a, a couple yeah. or just a, you know, a few of your personal goals for your next term? Uh, transparent economic development. The TIF program needs to be totally reformed. We need a, a, a point system which would prioritize which TIFs deserve that funding and which don't. Mm -hmm. uh, we need budget reform. One of the reasons why I didn't want to go into that closed meeting, one of Mr. Roloff's goals that he stated was to evaluate the need for a budget committee. <laughs> Sorry, sir, my <laughs> amendment right. said we are creating a budget committee. Right. And he and the mayor were supposed to come back with something, Exactly. Right? And so that will not stand as one of his goals. We need a, f you've been calling for yep. this for a long time. Absolutely. We need a functional budget committee, citizen-led, and uh, we need to continue with the neighborhood uh, revitalization, which I relate heavily to infrastructure redevelopment. You know, if people don't have good streets, it's hard to have that spirit of neighborliness. Okay. Uh, very good. And just real quickly, we recently did a show with uh, Justin Mitchell, mm -hmm. who is trying to get some beach water monitoring yeah. and testing done down at the uh, beach at Menominee Park. Uh, you know, I, I hope that you being so much right. of a green activist sure. would help to move this forward. Absolutely. I mean, the university yeah. is willing to do it free. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> you absolutely. Know? Yeah. I don't see why anyone in their right mind would turn yeah. it down. Well, yeah. Mark so. Roloff in his last message to the city council said that the testing will go forward for this year. Oh, good. Really? Yeah. Oh, good. Right. Yeah. That's Does good Justin news. know that? Justin knows that. Excellent. Right. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Because yeah. he really did a lot of good work on uh, this. Great work. Yep. He, right. it, and it will go forward. Hopefully it will go forward every year from now. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Tony, thanks much for being here. Good luck on April 7th. Thank you. And uh, that's going to do it for us. We'll see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.